to welcome all of you here tonight. Those of you who have joined us on live stream, <clears throat> we count the fellowship of God's people a very precious thing. This will be the 15th message in the series on the New Covenant. The unanimity of God and man. That is what the covenant is going to accomplish. The oneness of God and man. The, the agreement of God and man. The eradication of variance between God and man. The removal of hostility between God and man. The ability to rejoice in the presence of God. The matter of being instant to respond to God. All that's involved in unanimity between God and man. <clears throat> now the new covenant is, is the means by which God is saving his people. He is, the blood, I understand about Christ being a Savior, the blood of Christ being an atonement. I understand that. But all of that's within the, within the context of the covenant. The covenant is a, is a circumference in which God works to initiate and to consummate salvation. He will not step outside this covenant. God will not bless people that are in fundamental disagreement with himself. He will not. I'm not making it what men say. Everything that men say is notwithstanding. And there's, within the confines of Christendom or organized Christianity, there is too much toleration of sin and variance. It's a completely inappropriate percentage. I have heard, I don't care to mention how many times, I have heard men say from the pulpits, read a text of scripture and say, that's not the way I would have said it. Men ought to be afraid. Amen. That violates everything with the new covenant. God has not made provision for men to be at variance with the way he thinks. Salvation doesn't open the door for that to happen yeah. at all. So those are the things we're going to establish. That the new covenant is it's not a system of thought or a set of theological tenets or a set of rules or a series of regimented steps. That's not what the New Covenant is. Now, as I've established, the New Covenant is the framework in which God can dwell and work in and with the people to bless them. It directly affects the, it directly addresses the effects of sin. For instance, <clears throat> sin caused disagreement with God so that God assessed of the best people now this is of the best people on earth Israel with whom he made a covenant where he focused all of his attention see he said your thoughts are not my thoughts and my thoughts are not your thoughts saith the Lord as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. See, and God could not bless people within that kind of framework. Now, this has some startling ramifications. See, people, see, because this is not preached very much, people don't think about it very much. See, we're, we're living in a non-Bible reading society. Plus, we're living in a non-Bible preaching society. So people, they aren't aware of them, but these fundamental things. That when God says, you don't think like me, 
You don't act like me. That's serious stuff. That's exactly what will land people in hell. This, so the new covenant is a means to address. <laughs> it addresses that situation. Amen. So there's not disagreement. He's going to address it by putting his laws into their mind and writing them in their hearts. That will address that situation, see. When God puts his, mind, his laws in your mind and writes them in your heart, and you add that up, the, to the total is agreement with God. Yeah. Amen. So that's addressed. He addresses the worship of false gods. <laughs> People can, God does not allow a person to serve someone that's not God. He doesn't allow someone to worship someone that's not God. May sound, their God may sound like a good idea, may be very attractive, but you shall have no other gods before me. You must not. Amen. He does not allow you or anybody else to love someone more than they love him or to serve someone more than they serve him. Well, the New Covenant addresses that. He says, I will be their God. Amen. That's what the new covenant does. They have the framework of the new covenant. People do serve God. They do love God. They do prefer God. They choose him above everybody else. That is what they do. If they don't do that, they're not in. Now, you've got to apologize for them, make programs for them, you know, make concessions for them. If they can be a part of a church, you can make them, be sure you maintain a good attendance and things like this. You can, but after all said and done, after all is said and done, if people are operating in service to some other God, they are out. Amen. Okay, well, that sounds rough. It is rough. Yeah. <laughs> when Jesus comes again, he's going to destroy all of them that know not God. Yeah. So the new covenant addresses, he addresses that situation. He says, now the new covenant... I will be their God. Amen. And the uh, the identity of the people with God. See, God didn't identify with the people. But the New Covenant addresses that. He said, they shall be my people. See, he, address, he addresses that situation. They will be my people. I'm not going to have to, like the prophets, they always were speaking against the people. I mean, you read any of the prophets, they're hammering on the people all the time. They're hammering on the people because the people are out of the way. They're rebuking them. And they're telling what God's going to do and the judgments of God are going to fall. And it's over and over and over and over again. See, people maybe haven't read the prophets uh, from Isaiah, Isaiah, from Samuel on, how they talked to the people. They didn't brag on the people, let me tell you. See, God addressed, uh, and he addressed that situation. The new covenant addresses that situation. They will be my people. He's not going to compromise for them to be his people. Something's going to take place in the framework of the new covenant that God's going to stand up for these people. Hmm? New covenant addresses the situation. See, the people... Uh, they didn't know God. That was a situation that God had to face. Here's a people. He gave them the law, gave them the prophets, gave them all the blessings, gave them all the promises, made all the covenants with them, even sent Jesus to them. But they didn't know God. They weren't familiar with God. They weren't acquainted with God. Well, they could sin right in the face of God. Didn't bother them. Well, the new covenant addresses that situation. It says, they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. See, the new covenant addressed that, addressed and resolved that situation. And other things, yeah, I'm, sh I'm showing that the new covenant addressed the problems that sin caused. Unrighteousness prevailed. 
Well, there's got to be some way to address address this as sin piles up. See, it it accumulates. <laughs> it treasures up. When you sin, it, it is sins just don't uh, one one and one by one, and they they uh, pile up unless they're forgiven. If they pile up, heap up. You can imagine what some folk are going to face on the day of judgment. I mean, it makes you quake. Someone lived to be 85, 90 years old, not in the Lord. Just, I, just, I can't even imagine. The New Covenant addresses that. He said, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. He addresses that situation. God's going to make a provision for him in righteousness to forget their sins. To blot them out like a cloud. Cast them in the depths of the sea where they can't be found. Within the framework of the new covenant, provision is made for that. It is not made outside the new covenant. God like didn't change and all of a sudden he's tolerant of sin. That, that's not what happened. See the new covenant. These are the, these things that what the new covenant is stated is Hebrews. It's, the original stated in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, is repeated in Hebrews 8, 10 through 13, and in Hebrews 10, 16, and 17, and then it tells you, Hebrews tells you, this is the covenant that Jesus is mediating. This new covenant is the covenant under which we live. It's not something going to happen after Jesus comes to earth to reign, as they say. This is what we're living under right now. And I hate to inform people that are always working out programs for people to resolve their problems, but all problems between God and man have been addressed thoroughly and adequately in the New Covenant. Amen. Nothing's been skipped over. Nothing that you'd think that they had had been skipped. You'd think a lot of stuff had been skipped over. Hmm? Some people write books, big books about how married people are to get along. Well, you think maybe God skipped over that. Hmm? People develop long, lengthy programs and procedures that stretch over years that teach people how to form new habits. Why, well, you'd think, you'd think God skipped over that in salvation. He didn't. Everything's fully addressed. As soon as you got to leave the new covenant to address some problem, you are in forbidden territory. And we ought to do not even listen to these people. Amen. Not at all. So let me state this again: that the new covenant is the framework within, within which God has fully and thoroughly and once and for all addressed all the problems sin created. It's within the framework of the new covenant. <clears throat> now, the <clears throat> as to the meaning of unanimity, from the English point of view, it's an act or fact of being of one opinion about something. See, that's how, that's how the world, you see things the same way. You, you do things the same way. You think out things the same way. So that's unanimity, harmony. <coughs> our thoughts are his thoughts, his, our ways are his ways. Well, let's say it another way. We have the mind of Christ. See, that's... Amen. Or let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. See, that's saying the same, the same, same thing. To be spiritually minded. That's saying the same thing. It's life and peace. See, that's what he's saying. Unanimity is we have been brought into accord, harmony, fellowship, union with God. It's just not we're living in the same house. It's not that kind of. Yeah. There's a lot of people living in the same house and they're not united. Some people had to live in separate parts of the house because they fuss so much. Hmm? Some people go find second jobs so they don't have to fuss so much. In the house, in the house. See, but in God's house, this is not the way it is. In God's house. Before you get in the house, he causes you to be in agreement with him. 
then you can stay in the house as long as that situation continues. But as soon as you're in disagreement with God, he first of all tells you, you're in disagreement with me. Quench not the spirit and don't grieve the spirit and don't provoke me. He first warns, then if you don't out, that's it, out. That's what happens. Now in reconciliation, when you talk about reconciliation, that's sort of a big word that encompasses everything that I just got through saying. Reconciliation. It's the adjustment of a difference or restoration to favor. God's not reconciled, even though there's a song that says God is reconciled. I think I know what he meant, but he didn't say it right. We're the ones who were reconciled. He reestablished associations with men. He reestablished what was severed in Eden. Severed in Eden. Any association was just purely in preparation for what God was going to do with Christ. That's the only reason he was tolerant of anybody. Yeah. Amen. was until Jesus came. Amen. Then from that point on, he commanded everybody to repent. That's, that's what Paul said, didn't he? That's what he said. From that point on, after Jesus, no more toleration. Mm -hmm. Repent. Reestablish proper, friendly, interpersonal. It doesn't mean just that God loves you so much, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of difference how you act or anything. It's just that you know how God is. He just... Yes, I do know God. Yes, I do know how God is. And a few people can line up to testify to you about David. He can tell you how God is. Moses, man, he can tell you how God is. Huh? He can tell you. He said, look, I did one thing wrong, and I was excluded from the promised land. Huh? Adam said, look, 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 I did one thing wrong. David, look, I did one thing wrong. And I had never been able to get over it. Yeah. Hmm? So yes, it's a, to be reconciled to God, you kind of see that all this stuff begins to make sense. Mm -hmm. And to keep your unanimity with God, you've got to operate in the new covenant. You've got to operate in that framework. You can't have a do-it-yourself plan. You, you've got to yeah. operate in that covenant. And stay on friendly terms. You've got to stay on friendly terms. See, the new covenant made you a son in, within the new covenant. You were made a, a son. Within the new covenant, you were reconciled. I, I, you've got to maintain yeah. that status. Amen. Everything you need to do it has been supplied. You have access to God. You have an intercessor pleading for you. You've got a Holy Spirit within you, and he's interceding for you. You've got grace to teach you. There's no, you've got everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. You've got everything you need to maintain this relationship. But Satan, he's so crafty, he's invented a church of his own. And it's the kind of church he can work a bit more freely than he could in the, in the one Jesus built. So he's created a it's called Babylon the Great. He's created a church in that he's not suppressed in. He can move about with more freedom, and you really don't have to be in agreement with God. The, the thing that reconciliation has accomplished, Satan could care less about it, and he moves people to care less about it. There's all kind of people, brethren, that do not think like God, and it doesn't bother him one bit. They think God is tolerant to that kind of condition. God understands how we are. Yes, he does. It's we that don't understand. Men don't understand how they are. <coughs> so reconciliation addresses this problem. Now, let's, within the context of uh, reconciliation, let's think of enmity. Here God has uh, reconciled the people to himself. He's recreated them. He's made, enabled them to know him. 
And then here they are, people get in a situation where they're at loggerheads with God again. How serious is that? How, maybe maybe you, you remember when you were first baptized into Christ. Now, if you obeyed from the heart the form of doctor delivered you, the thought didn't enter your mind to disagree with God. I mean, it, it, it didn't enter your mind. You were just thankful you saw these things, and thankful you were forgiven. What, what's the enmity? Can, enmity means you're brandishing a sword against God. You, you're fighting God. Enmity can rise up. Now, James addressed some professed believers. They thought they ran. He said, oh, he says, you adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore would be a friend of the world is the, the, the enemy of God. All right, are you a friend of the world? Now you got to know whether you are or not. Does the world feel comfortable around you? Friend of the word, enmity. And enmity exists. The carnal mind is enmity against God, Romans 8, 7. The, carn the fleshly mind, the natural mind, the mind that's not regenerate. The mind like you had before you were born again. That kind of mind is enmity. It's, a, it's hostile. It punched God in the nose if it could. It's the way it is. It doesn't care. The flesh will make you see, I know God doesn't approve of this, but I want to do it anyway. Yeah. I'm going to do it anyway. I'll quit going to church for a month and then I won't be thinking about God very much. And it'll be easy. You think people don't think like this? They do. The fleshly mind, the mind is enmity. Carnal mind is enmity against God. How serious is that? Well, all that God went through, so to speak, to reconcile us to God, how serious can it be to be at enmity with, against God. How, how serious can that be? If Jesus died to reconcile us to God, and if in the new birth we're joined to the Lord, and we're made partakers of Christ, and have the mind of Christ, how serious is it to be carnally minded? Yeah. <clears throat> it denies the reality of the new covenant. See, the law is now written on the heart, placed in the mind, and that destroys the enmity. That's what that means. When it says he, he put it in your heart, wrote it in your mind, and then those are reversed in Hebrews 10. He wrote it in your mind and put it in your heart. That's what destroyed that enmity. And what was, what was the thing... That you were in agreement with, what kind of thing, did, what kind of agreement was this? That we should all be kind to our neighbors? It was the laws. How's that for the basis of agreement? It's the laws. See, some people think that God's eradicated the laws. That's of the law. We don't want that. Well, are you in agreement with it? Because the only way you can get out from under. The condemnation of law is to be in agreement with it. Amen. I don't mean intellectual agreement. I'm not. I'm sorry. I know that's in the Bible thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, it's written in your mind, put it in your heart. So the last thing you'll do is violate that law. And if you do, you'll confess it. You get out of that state. See, the new covenant ad addresses the situation that sin caused. And it brings unanimity between God and man. So when God says, thou shalt not, man says, I will not. Now Israel said that at the foot of Sinai. They said, all that God has said, we will do. But now when it got down to the doing of it, they didn't, they didn't do it. And that was the best people. This was the best people now. We're not talking, talking about the Egyptians here or the Assyrians. 
These were the best people in the world. The only people God had given a revelation to. These were, these were those people. And they, uh, they were at variance with God. The same law which condemns us now blesses us. I've said this, I think, before, but in Christ, the Ten Commandments, they become ten promises. <laughs> and uh, you'll, you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. See, that's, that's what happens in the New Covenant. Hmm? You, uh, you won't have any other gods before me. That happens in the New, co new Covenant. It says, you'll not bow down to anybody else but me. You'll, you'll keep the Sabbath day. You'll keep my days holy. You'll, you'll do that. You, you won't lie. You won't steal. You won't commit adultery. You won't covet. See, when he writes it on your heart, then that becomes your nature. Yeah, amen. It's, a, it's a new man nature. We, you, surely you understand this. You've got another nature too, but when you were baptized into Christ, God crucified the old man, Romans 6, 6. God crucified the old man for you. Now that your job is to keep him on the cross. Don't don't let him run your life. See, when people sin, they've con they've consented to the old man running their life. But to do that, you had to become an enemy of God to do that. See? <laughs> the new covenant, in order to live within the framework of the new covenant, this is a blessed blessed thing. Now being reconciled to God, we are no more enemies. Romans 5.10 says, you were enemies. And, and incidentally, God fights his enemies. Eventually, he will curse his enemies. The person has got to get out of that category. Amen. Enemies of God. Got to get out of that category. The new covenant guarantees that you can. That, see, that's the blessing. <laughs> that's the good news. We got to we Amen. got to deliver people. That's the good news. Look, you don't have to stay the way you are. Amen. You can come out of that. Amen. The result of not being one with God, not being joined to Him, is spiritual harlotry. And spiritual harlotry is when you take the love that belongs to God and you give it to somebody else. Like, like a husband or a wife that commits whoredoms, takes the love due to the wife or the husband and gives it to somebody else. We say that's not right. And it isn't. That isn't right. But to take the love and affection, which is the dominant love and affection, which is the governing love and affection, which is the preeminent love and affection, and take that and give it to somebody else a person, an institution, a church, a way of life, that's becoming a spiritual whore. That's how God regards it now. That's how God regards it. And the, uh, the false church, or Babylon the Great, is actually a whore. She offers herself to highest bidder, whoever. That's what she's called. God's what God calls her. She has a whine of her fornication. And then she's got ways of promoting this, this love affair with someone other than God. She, she has like wine intoxicates. It's like it intoxicates people. So they actually give more of themselves to some other entity, some other religious group, some other, something other than God. Yeah. They had like had to be spiritually intoxicated yeah. to do that. And Babylon the Great, it's got this wine cup. <laughs> even makes the nations, kings even drink from it. Mm. Businessmen drink from it. You've read the Revelation, what it says about Babylon the Great, how the kings of the earth committed fornication with her, how that all the merchants of the earth, the businessmen of the earth committed fornication with her. It's in there. God talks about this. 
that there's a, there's a system of defection that has a, an intoxicating effect upon people. I've seen it happen. I think once I was caught in it myself. I thought I was, I said, I got to defend the, uh, our church, you know, our church. We got, we got the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And we're actually no different than anybody else when it comes down to living, but we got, we got the, the right position. But see, you can't be different than God and be saved. That's the bottom line. God knew it. Man didn't know it. See, but God knew it. So he, he made this new covenant that in effect made men like himself. So they thought like himself. So their laws were there, now became their delights. See, and he put it in their hearts so they wanted to do it. Put it in their minds so they thought about doing it. See, the new covenant has addressed all the things sin caused. In salvation, we experience being made one spirit with the Lord. As 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Now that, oh, that. See, married people, they're one flesh. Mm -hmm. right? Male and female become one flesh. Right? And that, that's the closest of all physical unions. But what about one spirit? That's accomplished in salvation. The new covenant has made full provision for that to actually happen, mm -hmm. to be one spirit. It can, you can arrive at the point where when you face a situation that you maybe you never faced before and, and you're not quite sure how to assess it, if you want to do the will of God, or as Jesus said, any man who wills to do the will of God, you want to do the will of God, God can enable you to see that thing like he sees it. Now, it may mean that you tie yourself to it if it's holy, or it may mean you run from it because it's unholy. But see, God, the new covenant makes provision, see, for you to have unanimity with God Amen. in thinking, in feeling, in planning, yeah. in assessing. You can do it like God does it. What do you think this is when, when the... Paul wrote the churches, and Paul wrote individuals like Timothy and Titus and Philemon, and Peter and James wrote scattered, and Jude wrote scattered believers. Why do you think they were able to pinpoint weak areas, see, and give solutions to them? It's because they were one with God. They had the mind of the Lord. God was speaking through their mouth and through their pen. Through their pen, they were in agreement with the God. They weren't just saying God told me to say this. It wasn't that. They saw what they were talking yeah, about, amen. and it affected them. I marvel you're so soon removed. <laughs> it affected them because they were like God. See, sin does affect God. To me, it's marvelous. In this uh, unanimity, we are made partakers of Christ. See, Christ, he partook of our, he partook of our needs. He was made flesh and blood. He, he became one like us. But he's not like that anymore. You understand that, don't you? <laughs> but that was so we could be like him. Amen. Someone had to make the sacrifice. For this, for us, for us to partake of Christ, someone had to be changed for this to take place. And so Jesus agreed to come down so he could, in behalf of humanity, he could take away sin, crush the head of the serpent, and all the things he did so that God could get on with what he wanted to do. He wanted to work. He wanted his mind to be in his people. He wanted his people to have his purpose and his objective. So he didn't always have to pound them on the head. He, he was chasing them, but if we judge ourselves, we'll not be chasing. That's the word. 
Now, what I'm saying, as clumsy as it may be, is that the new covenant has made complete provision for all of this to happen. And God will not step outside that new covenant to accomplish any of these objectives. He'll not deal with you one-on-one -on -one and sort of a private work on you and shape you up. He'll do it within the framework of the new covenant. So you, you need to become familiar with the new covenant, have a working knowledge of the new covenant. I'll put my laws in their minds, write them in their hearts. I'll be to them a God, that is, they'll serve me. They'll be to me a people. I'll be devoted to them. All of them will know me from the least to the greatest. I won't remember their sins and iniquities anymore. I'll be merciful of their unrighteousnesses. I won't deal with them on the basis of what they have done. I'll deal with them on the basis of what Christ has done. See? I'm going to become more familiar with that because that's, that's the fence within which God is working with you. So Jesus becoming... Jesus becoming like us did not forge a union between God and man. See? More was needed than that. See? Jesus came down, Jesus suffered and died, but that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. There had to be a change wrought in humanity itself. God just couldn't do it because it needed to be done. He ha sin had to be dealt with and dealt with thoroughly. And Jesus did that. And now God can Amen. get on with the work, Amen. so to speak. What happens is when you're added to the Lord, that's a phrase that's used in, in Acts 5.14, said that multitudes of people were added to the Lord. That's intriguing. Isn't that an intriguing expression? added to the Lord. That's what God is doing in the New Covenant. Brother. He's, uh, he's making us like Himself so He can like converse with us. God doesn't talk with people that are in disagreement with Him. Unless, I mean, he, I know He talked to Cain, but it wasn't a blessing. <laughs> it wasn't a blessing. But He wants to communicate, He wants to talk profitably. He's got things to show you that, that you need to be shown. He's got things to tell you that you need to be told. But he can't do it unless this reconciliation or unanimity takes place. Amen. And when it does, it works through Jesus. But when you're in the house, you get all the provisions of the house. And Jesus is faithful in all his house. He always dispenses everything to everybody. So I'll leave, I'll leave that with you. Amen. Brother Aaron has our exhortation tonight.